about a game. It's a red skin. Happy New Year. Hello and welcome to another episode of Corgi Town USA in my lapish chuckles, our spokes Korg. Did I say I was candy? No, you did not. I'm candy. You're candy. <laughs> Hi, I'm Catherine. Uh, on the floor in front of me is my little boy Digby. Sitting back here is the one, the only booger. And there is Mr. Papichulo himself. Mortimer Barnabas. Mortimer Barnabas. Morty B. And you, if you listen to us regularly, if you're new here, hi. Welcome. Hi, welcome. Thank you for tuning in. This is our fifth season. And we are glad to be here in 2024, bringing you relevant content, all things Corgi and Pet Palmer Lifestyle. Uh, strap in. This will be a an emotional episode. Go get your box of tissues. Yeah. Let's uh, just say it like it is. Yeah. We talk a lot about DM, degenerative myelopathy, on the podcast. And we have in previous seasons because it's very important that we know about it, that we're aware. Also, I'm part of Shade Out DM, a very dear, near and dear to my heart organization that helps with awareness and also emotional support support group for uh, DM paw rinse. And I was passionate about it before my dear hammer rescue came down with symptoms and started taking the journey. And uh, we, we battled it for about, I don't know if we battled it, we managed it for about two years and had to say goodbye very recently. So there may be some tears this episode, but I wanted to bring on uh, it's Miriam Valer. So if you've been with us, she was uh, one of our guests. Kat couldn't make that episode, but she was one of our guests in the first season. She wrote a book called Another New Normal. She has been through this journey more than once, um, which is unfathomable to me right now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's called Another New Normal. Just kind of talking about um, going through the DM journey, uh, different things. And we're also going to bring on Tawny, my dear friend with Shade Out DM, because she has also gone through this, which is where Shade Out DM was birthed. So uh, these are important perspectives. And let's bring them on. Absolutely. Miriam, welcome back. Thanks for having me, Candy and Kat. I really appreciate the Thanks. chance to talk with you today. It's an honor to be here. Thank you. Thanks it's an honor for to making have you. the time. Let's bring Tawny on. Tawny, welcome back. Hello. Thank you for having us. Of course. Yeah. Well, we're going to, uh, as I've just warned, dear listener, dear viewer, this could get emotional and it's going to be a little bit of a heavy episode, but I want to talk about what I learned about having a DM dog. Yes. And the reason why I want to have this conversation is because to me, and I talk a lot about this on the show, perspective is everything. And I had a perspective about degenerative myelopathy how it affects corgis and the other 99 plus dog breeds and the paw rids that deal with it. And I, my perspective is a little bit more full and a little changed in ways. Uh, and some I expected, some I didn't expect. So I want to talk about what I learned about it. I think I'm hoping that it helps some others um, kind of manage and uh, maybe they can learn a thing or two, but also those who haven't dealt with it and don't really know. Yeah, we heard about Dan. Let's tell you a little bit more about it. Uh, let's get a little deep into this so that we can educate and also hopefully lend support to others that are going through it or might be going through it who might be scared and might not know if some of the things they're feeling and dealing with are normal. And and I think, and finally, we'll, we'll talk about the fact that DM is preventable. Yeah, for sure. And why we're so passionate about why it. Why we're so passionate about it and what you as someone who may be wanting to get a corgi or as in the case of um, my in-laws, Eric's dad and stepmom, uh, a German shepherd who had, they had one. Uh, also had highly affected. DM and, and so many other breeds. So what can you do if you want to get a dog from a breeder? This well, it's an important genetic test. Yeah. We will talk about that as well. So I will start off with uh, catching everyone up. If you're new here, I had Hammer. He was a very integral member of the Corgi Committee. He was my rescue of about nine years. Yes. He, I got him from a guy living out of a van. And we hope that you caught our 100th episode with Susan from Queen's Best. I let her know that if it weren't for Queen's Best, I wouldn't have Hammer. He didn't go through the rescue program, but he was a repost because the gentleman that posted him didn't 
really know better than to post them on Craigslist. Scary things can happen when they wind up on Craigslist. That's right. But the guy was living in a van. Something happened in a situation. He used to have a home in a yard. He no longer did. And so he posted Hammer on Craigslist. And I came out to see him. And I was very nervous. I didn't know what condition I would get him in. Uh, he's a homeless, right? The, his owner yeah. was homeless. It's hard to know if he was mangy or malnourished or who knew. Uh, he was perfect. He was absolutely perfect. And I remember pulling around. I met him in a McDonald's parking lot in Quartzsite, Arizona. That's where I got him. And so my friend that drove me set his car up with like dog toys and beds. He said, I'm, you're going to lay back there and you're going to bond with him as I drive you back. Wonderful, wonderful friend. And so we, we got there. I pull, we pull around the corner and I see him sitting there, beautiful red Corgi, gorgeous chest. And I just start crying because I'm like, oh my God, he's beautiful. <laughs> like, I didn't know what to expect. I had low expectations thinking, gosh, we're going to probably going to have to do a flea dip and we're going to have to do some nutritional assessment. He wasn't, he was absolutely beautiful um, and so incredibly well-tempered, well-mannered. And so Always. I asked the guy if I could say hello. And so I get down on my knees and I just say hammer and he come right up to me. And the guy's jaw dropped and he said, he's such a shy dog. And I said, I didn't know they made shy corgis. <laughs> I've never had a shy corgi, but he, he said, oh yeah, I, he never comes right up to anybody. And then of course I've got tears again because I'm like, he knows I'm his mama. He knows. So that was my beginning of my journey with hammer. And he was just an amazing dog and went on many, many of our adventures with us. And then I got involved with shade out DM a little over two years ago, Tawny. Yeah. Hard to, yeah. hard, hard to imagine that it's been that long. Um, but I got involved because of course we started the podcast here at Corgi town USA. And I said, I definitely want to tackle DM. It's very prevalent in Corgis. Let's learn. And at the time season one, Tawny wasn't available yet. We had Miriam and we talked about the book and uh, some of Miriam's journeys, uh, multiple journeys. And I was educated, things I didn't know. And then Hammer started to change his gait a little bit and we started to show symptoms. And at that time, I was already trying to get him used to, my vet told me to get him used to a carp because he had hip dysplasia. We had already had the, the surgery. Sure. Yes. So what I thought was going on was that other hip was going. And my vet told me, you know, his age, he's not going to be able to recover from that. It was very intense physical therapy we did to build a muscle joint prior to that, five years before. And so anyway, that was very much DM. It's we can talk about how it's diagnosed and how it's you don't really get definitive diagnoses. Um, we talk about necropsy and things like this afterwards. He had every symptom. Uh, the the changing gait, he started dragging his feet. He just continued to deteriorate. Uh, so I was forced to say goodbye to him. And I want to talk about how hard this is. So he was um, he was happy. He was healthy. He had perfect blood work. He was smiling. He was smiling. Yes. And so for you to have to look at your dog and kill them, I had to say goodbye to him that it was that or wait for him to suffocate to death. And I did not want him to go through that. No. And his friends are around him. We're feeding him cheeseburgers. He's loving it. And chocolate shakes. <laughs> and chocolate shake. You gave him a chocolate shake. Cat was there. Um, and I had to, I had, I had to kill my dog. I had to, I had a vet there, but we had, we had to euthanize him and say goodbye to him as he's happy and he's smiling at me. Um, that's the hardest thing I'm probably ever going to have to do. I hope it's the hardest thing I ever have to yep. do. So I want to talk about this. Um, this was there. No part of this was easy. Um, but anybody who has to go through this, I don't want to make light of it. I want to say it how it is and, um, talk about, talk about it. So thank you for listening. I know this is very hard. It's definitely hard for me. It's hard for anybody to listen um, sorry, cat. That's uh, okay. <laughs> but that's Hammer's story. Um, at the end, I gave him the most beautiful life I possibly could. Um, and he deserved every wonderful day that he had. Um, I did not enjoy seeing him deteriorate in front of my eyes. No. Um, so I want to also talk about the emotional process that's involved with that. I could not mom my way out of what was happening to him. Everything that occurred, everything that changed, it was always shuffling. Okay, we have this managed. Okay, now the routine has changed. Something changes. Their body changes. Now he has to have a new cart. This one doesn't fit him anymore. Um, you know, I had to watch him do that. There was I couldn't fix that for him. I couldn't fix it. All I could do was manage it. Um, so I don't want to make light of this disease. I want everybody to understand why we are so passionate about spreading awareness um, and some of the things we hear that maybe we can help dispel. I hope I made that pretty succinct. You did. Uh, a lot of emotions tied into that. So I want to make sure that I can make it. So that is Hammer's story.
Miriam, uh, again, she she wrote another new normal. Can you please tell us about your journeys? Sure. And what you just said, Candy, really is why I called the book what I did, another new normal, because it you would just start to feel like you had your rhythm in place, that you had everything down, and then oh my gosh, something else changed, and you had to you know, it was just this constant adapting to what Sassy needed. Sassy was my corgi that I had adopted in 2015. And it, I mean, it just, I just felt like I was thrown off balance for two and a half years, you, you know, just managing, just trying to stay on top of what's the next thing that's going to happen. And it, I mean, it really, it is just finding that new normal practically every day, it seems like. So so with Sassy, I had gotten her, she was older when I adopted her, um, and that was in 2015. Almost immediately after I got her, just like maybe six or seven months after I got her, she had torn an ACL. Mm -hmm. And because of her age and the fact that she was still bearing weight on it, the vet didn't feel like she would really necessarily benefit from surgery. He said, you know, the scar tissue will form and support that joint. So we don't, you know, let's not do surgery, but she had to be on crate rest, you know, for 12 weeks. So did that. And then as soon as we started increasing her exercise, she tore on the other side. So, you know, here we are <laughs> half a year into, you know, her rehabbing from those, you know, those injuries. And it was after that last set of rehab, you know, of great rest, and then slowly, you know, increasing her exercise that I started to noticing her placing that right front or right pine paw in a weird place. It was just like, you know, I'd just look at her, we'd be walking and she would just like, you know, kind of cross over, you know, a little knuckling. And I'm like, what is going on? And at that time, I had never heard of DM. I, I mean, I came into this like with no prior knowledge to DM and I started to just like, there's, there's something wrong here. I used to be a massage therapist. And so I have just like this much knowledge about, you know, the nervous system and muscles and things. And it was just like, that looks neurological, you know, just something. I mean, it was just like, you know, I kept trying to tell myself it was from the CCL tears, but it was just like, you know, my gut feeling was it was neurological. So then I started Googling. Let's let's see what's out there that causes one hind paw, you know, to have ataxia. And that's where I first, you know, ran into the references of DM. I mean, the IVDD was mentioned, you know, spinal tumors, you know, it, there were some other things. But I mean, it's just as soon as I started reading about DM, it was just like, oh, that's got to be it. And you know, she just, she was textbook classic, you know, with her progression. You know, I, I did get her to a specialist vet to, you know, have them do an assessment. That vet had had a boxer with DM, so was very, very familiar. And so he didn't hesitate to give the presumptive diagnosis. Um, and so, yeah, we just, you know, I mean, I was just learning as much as I could as I went and I, you know, I was taking lots of photos and just kind of copious notes about what I was seeing because I was putting it on Facebook on my, you know, just on my personal page, you know, just, it's like, Hey guys, this is not any, <laughs> this, this is a disease that we need to be aware of. And, you know, and through that met Tawny, quite a few other people in the DM community um, you know, Bobby Mayer, who wrote the fabulous Corgis on Wheels and, you know, just started to really connect with people who'd had prior experience picking their brain, um, you know, and just, it, it, it was, I mean, I've, I've taken care of lots of animals in my life. I have never had an experience like DM. I mean, for two and a half years, Sassy was the sun and I was the little planet going around her, you know, I mean, my whole world revolved around what that dog needed. And, yeah. you know, and it was just like, you know, as DM progresses, what she needs is 
she can't scratch herself anymore. You have to remember to give her a good, you know, a good scratching and, you know, to get all those little itchy spots taken care of. You've got to turn them over so that they don't develop sores. You've got, you know, I mean, it's on and on and on. It's not just putting them in a wheel, you know, in wheels to help them walk. It's all those little things, making sure a fan's blowing on them because they can't regulate their temperature. Um, I mean, it's just, you know, I mean, I could not fall asleep at night until I heard her breathing calm down to where she was in a nice deep sleep. It's like, okay, now I can rest. But if she got agitated during the night, then I was instantly awake again. For, fortunately for me, she did sleep pretty well most of the time. But um, it's, it's just as you get farther into that journey, you have to anticipate every single thing that dog needs from mm -hmm. a scratch to, you know, whether they're hot, whether they need water, whether, I mean, everything, everything. And it's grueling. It is just a grueling journey, but it's one that's filled with absolute love because you care for that animal so much that you're willing to do that. Yeah. Yeah. You don't, you definitely don't oh, mind doing it. No, but you get, yeah, it's, that's the best way to put it. It's, yeah. I don't think that I slept a full night in over two years because yeah. Hammer didn't sleep through the night. He woke up panting a lot. And so it was always a, a mystery. Is this pain? Is this that you're hot? Is this that you're uncomfortable? Is this that right. something's itching? They can't tell you, right? Right. Or are you just feeling anxious because you can't roll over? Right. Your, right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I mean, it, and that trying to guess, <laughs> you know, you, I mean, I just had my whole list of things to check off when Sassy would do, be doing that. You know, it's just like, okay, well, we'll start with the obvious one. Do you need to drink? Okay. Let's go see if you need to pee or poop. Let's, you know, and you just, mm -hmm. you know, an hour later, as you've worked through everything on the list, you finally at some point hit the right thing. Oh, right. you just needed this. All right. You know, but it's, <laughs> I mean, it really is, it's, it is full-time work. I mean, I, I don't think for, for over two years, I did not leave her for more than an hour or and a half at a time. I mean, it's like my life, I, I mean, I would do a quick run to the grocery store. Yeah. You know? I mean, occasionally I would just go out and grab, you know, a quick meal with a friend, but it's like, for the most part, if she could not be with me, I did not leave her because, you know, when she was still mobile enough that she could scoot herself into awkward places. I mean, I didn't want to have her, I didn't want to come home and find her stuck under the coffee table or, you know, something like that. And because she was perfectly capable for a period of time of doing things like that, but then not being able to get unstuck. Out. Yeah. 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 I had well, a lot of that. Yeah. Um, Tani, do you want to share about Casey and Shade Out DM? Well, um, no, I think I, I hear Miriam say it does. It becomes instinctual, you know, so you, you can't control the instincts once they develop like that. It's very difficult. And I did that with Casey, too. Yes. But um, before I forget, I wanted to really point out um, how a great a celebrity doggy hammer was for Shade Out DM. He became this folks org um, for Shade Out DM. Um, and that was so helpful. He attended uh, a lot of the events, but especially the uh, Western Veterinary Conference and being able to show vets what it looks like, you know. And he was just like the best dog, super cool about everything, didn't yep want to like i mean he and we never had to worry like how he was going to behave with anybody he took it in stride he did just an he amazing did. job so um, and huge huge credit to his mama candy for um bringing him to all those events and juggling everything um yes. because it, it was i mean it, it's so impactful when people can see it versus uh, see touch and feel right or whatever the mm -hmm. saying is um versus reading in a book um, and I am so grateful that we have Miriam's book to be able to say, now that you've seen it, now read about it. Now here is all the details. If, if this is what you're facing, definitely get this book. It'll tell you what you're, it, it should 
start to expect and what things to look for. I mean, it's just, goes hand in hand you know and i'm just grateful that i had always intended on writing a book never got it done <laughs> i'm glad miriam was able to do it and she did a beautiful job so um and she's so kind and generous too in in always uh donating your copies of books for prizes for our race and you know things to help incentivize people to to get their interest and in, and in do those things so we, we all work really well together, and, and, and the whole point is circling the wagons to bark out loud for the pups and, and speak out loud. And, and uh, yeah, Casey, I didn't know. I didn't know what we were getting into. I, I didn't had never heard. I had had corgis for 30 years, had never heard of the M, and went to five vets and three chiropractors, and nobody knew what was going on with her. And so we just kept digging. <clears throat> but with Casey... She always she had a uh, eye that didn't produce tears. It got damaged when she was a puppy by her litter. So her and I were already close. So I wasn't quite sure how much um, DM would play a role in our connection, you know. But uh, absolutely, uh, it made a huge difference, and it became instinctual. Everything like you start to feel like okay, it's about time for medicine, or oh, it's a, it's about time to go tinkle, or it's about time for this, it's, it's about time for that. And and if I was off by like a couple minutes, she was the first one to reprimand me and let me know, like, <laughs> mom, 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 you didn't this, mom, 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 I need this, you know. So she never um, was quiet, and, and like, like, she wasn't, um, very she never complained about stuff but she also wasn't very uh she wasn't a whiner you know instead it was like i need this i need that i need this she's very commanding and um so that's what led me to uh like and i think hammer was more passive because i got to know him and i'm grateful he, he was just like cool and chill about okay yeah i'll take this in stride and i'll take that in stride so he did. Casey taught me a lot because she was bossy <laughs> um, <laughs> And, and I, it makes it so that I can kind of tell you guys, I mean, Candy would say things to me like, um, oh, yeah, I'm glad that you told me about that. And I'm like, well, I wouldn't have known, but Casey told me. <laughs> Casey didn't let, miss a beat. So, um, but yeah, it's so important to read your animals and listen to them. And, and um, so when they're gone, it sucks so it bad does. because suddenly everything stops. And I thought... I would sleep for a week when she was gone because she only let me sleep for four hours a night, every night. And, um, it's still like that. I don't, I don't, I don't sleep. That's just, that became the habit. And so I, I sleep for four hours and then it's like, I gotta get up. I gotta do something. Um, and it's just, they, they, um, it's subconscious, right? Cat. I'm going to lean yeah. on cat this one and cat, uh, has been a huge, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to leave you out. No, um, no. Huge, amazing support for Shade Out DM and with Thank the you. grief uh, counseling and stuff that you offer has been very, very, very helpful too. So, um, but yeah, it all goes together. It all goes together. And, um, thanks to Candy, you, you, you developed the support system. And so you did have a lot of support, uh, during this time. And, um, I mean, it just goes to show we can't buy uh, not being sad, you know? <laughs> like, no. it, it just takes its toll and everything changes. And so that's why we're here today, right? To talk about um, how everything changes. And I yeah. think as the outside observer, um, you know, the thing about being a parent, cats, dogs, eh, they leave us before we leave them. That's just a fact. Um, and seeing the suffering, the unnecessary suffering that happens because uh, a dog develops DM. And then to hear that, you know, vet after vet after vet doesn't recognize a disease that over 100 breeds of dog get. A genetic disease that is preventable that happens in over 100 breeds of dog. And to hear you say, Tawny, that 
vet after vet after vet had no idea what this is. It's infuriating. It's kind of unfathomable when you put it that way. Yeah. And, and, and again, it's, it's that, that suffering that they go through um, that just makes it so much worse. And, and before- well, I, I want to talk about DM grief. It, yeah. It, it is a specific type of grief. Yes. Not that any is more important or less important no. than the other. But we did the episode, our season closer for season four was with Lap of Love, which is who came out and helped us with Hammer. Uh, we talked about disenfranchised grief. Yes. And here at Corgi Town, we want to be part of the voice that changes the normalcy. Uh, disenfranchised grief is when it's not normalized. It, for instance, most of us have had the experience if we lose a loved one, you tell someone at the office, oh, I've got to take some time off. Someone dear to me per- passed away. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, take the time you need. You don't get the same support with pets in general society, at least here in America. Oh, that's a bummer. Sorry to hear about that. All right, well, we'll see you tomorrow. It's not, it's not, it, it's so heavy. And if we haven't normalized that this is a very specific type of grief and this is disenfranchised grief. So here at Corgi Town, we want to make that normal. Like this, we know how heavy this is. Let's make this normal so that you feel validated and then if you need to take time off you need to practice self-care everything you would with grief in general but with dm grief it's it's so strange because what both miriam and tani are talking about your whole life revolves around your dog's care schedule you are a caretaker so there's all this anticipatory grief and i'll be honest i'm grieving and it's awful but that anticipatory grief nearly killed me. It's I worst. think it was worse. I think it was worse for me personally because I couldn't, the guilt of I need to put this away until he's gone so he doesn't experience this energy I have so that I can put everything into making this as easy and as comfortable for him as possible despite however I'm feeling. But I couldn't separate from it. And anticipatory grief, for those who've never heard the term before, is that grief that we feel knowing that someone is going to pass. So uh, a friend or, or a pet is going to pass. Um, a friend, colleague of mine, and I did a surviving grief through the holidays uh, recently. And one of the things is that I warn against is anticipatory grief. You know, you see mom or dad or uh, older aunt or uncle at the, at the dinner table and you sit and you know that this is the last Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, whatever, that you will be with them and you send that energy to them of, you know, poor me for losing you, poor you for passing away. And we do the same thing with pets. We know that, and especially with something like DM, where you're watching each and every day, uh, the the symptoms uh, getting worse and worse and worse and you project the future that you don't know. You don't know what it's going to be like when you, when you say goodbye, you don't know what that day is going to be like. You don't know what tomorrow is going to be like for you, for them, for anybody. And yet we sit stuck in that anticipatory grief and that's what it is. Yeah, those, it was awful. The whole thing is awful, but the anticipatory was, that was crushing me. Yes. Crushing me. Because I got stuck on those lasts. This is the last time we're going to do this. We had to refill heartworm medication. And once a month, we all have our heartworm prevention, not medication, but prevention. And it happens every month. And then it came up to just a few days before I had to say, there's no there's no sense in giving him the heartworm. Why am I going to give him this? Right. Things like those little things would ac- absolutely buckle me to my knees. So that's that's part of it. And then the complete life change of ev- my entire life has revolved around this dog and his condition and how we manage it and how we keep him comfortable and everything he needs and me always being hyper aware. I don't know that I've actually truly relaxed. Within you may, that time. You may not. Because it, I just, I had tension. Like, is he, are we good? Has he had water? It, you know, it's, it's a constant chewing at you. And then when it's gone, you're like, oh, oh, oh. What, what, what do, do I do, I do with, with my, this energy? What do I do with my energy now? And, uh, and I'm going to compare it to humans again. If you've ever cared for a loved one, 
um, that needs constant care. Um, that's a DM dog. That's a DM a dog. And, 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 and you've cared for a loved one and then the loved one passes. You don't know what to do with yourself. Unfortunately, when they pass, people understand that you don't know what to do with yourself anymore. And they're, people tend to be, we're going back to disenfranchised grief. It's another human. I understand. I feel for you. Take your time. You know, get back into your old routine or your new normal. Every time someone passes, pet or otherwise, it becomes a new normal as well. When that happens with our, our fur babies, oh, well, you must be totally relieved. Would you say that if it was... Well, I don't think our listeners would Not say our that. listeners. Uh, what I'm saying is our no, listeners hear it this. It just happened recently to someone else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Our listeners it does happen, hear yeah. this. It happens. And so you've got to swallow and let people know what you need. Not in a mean way, uh, although I do it that way. But I, it's the same thing for me as if I were taking care of a human. So I need this time to get back to myself and my new self. I encourage everyone and reach out to me if, you know, I, I, I do this. Reach out to me. I'll give you some tips and tricks. Let people know what you need. Don't fall under, please, the assumption that, well, I've got to be more quiet about it mm -hmm. because they're right. It is just a pet. Mm -hmm. I love my pets more than a lot of humans I mm -hmm. know. And I'm, I know each and every one of us here and every one of our you know dear listeners, dear viewers does as well. <laughs> so Hammer was human to me. Hammer was very human. Um, in fact, and for whatever it's worth, for those who believe, for those who don't believe, I communicated with Hammer just before and just after. And I know it took him a minute to get used to not having wheels. And I know that um, from the communication that I had, believe it or not, um, and I know that it was this new wonderful thing for him it, you know and it's different for us here too he missed his freedom he missed his freedom and you know now he has that so yeah. when well, I, I was using an animal communicator when i had sassy and almost immediately after she passed the communicator texted me and she said i just got a message from sassy and it was I'd forgotten how much I love to run. Yeah. And I, I, I came completely unglued at that point. <laughs> Just... Yeah. Yes. And they do, and they communicate right away. And, you know, they let you know that they will visit and they yeah. do visit. And that thing that you see out of the corner of your eye is them. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely them. Everyone, your your DM babies, all of your fur babies, they're all right there. Right. Well, I want to talk about, since we're on this grief, uh, kind of some of the things that make this unique. And uh, Miriam can speak, so can Tani, but Miriam can speak to this. We, we talked a little bit about, there's so many layers to this. And part of this everything different, Kat, you mentioned relief, that there's, there's maybe a tiny sliver of it, but it's so buried under what, how, how did I, to me anyway, how did I not make this better? How did I, right. Where did I fall short? It, it was so buried under that to like, well, that was up to me to, to lessen, to lessen that for him. It shouldn't. And so there's so much guilt with, well, I don't want to be relieved. I want my dog back. Right. You know? And then, uh, the guilt of, oh, I, I don't have to do that anymore. Oh, we, we can just sleep now because there's nobody to wake us up to let us know they need to be scratched or they're hot. And so the relief comes in. You're not having to be 24-7 and you can relax that, but you're so conditioned to doing it 
that it's not an overnight thing. Oh, okay, cool. It's not no, like that not at, all. at all. And then you feel this tremendous amount of guilt. Like, I don't want to be happy about that because you miss them so much. And um, I'll jump in. It The guilt is something that, as society, we're taught to feel guilty. And the reality is there is an amount of relief. Um, it's, it's the reality. Um, especially when someone is sick, especially when our, our fur babies are sick, there is some amount of relief. Even if that relief is something as simple as I don't have to pick him up to move him from place to place and my back doesn't hurt as much. So there is, there is a physical relief. There's an emotional relief and we're taught to feel guilty. It's okay to be relieved is what you're saying. It yeah. is absolutely okay to be relieved. It is absolutely okay. And, and one of the things you could say is I would much rather hammer be physically here in my arms. And this you can say about anyone who's passed or any pet. I would much rather have them here in my arms and then know whatever your faith is, whatever your belief is, even if you believe in absolutely nothing, know that it's a memory that you still have of them. Um, in the Jewish religion, there's, a, a, or tradition, there is a saying, um, may his memory be a blessing. May her memory be a blessing. And, uh, and, I, and I think that's a beautiful saying. So anything from you believe in heaven or you believe in the afterlife or reincarnation or you simply believe that when some someone or something is gone it's gone open up to the open up to the at least the memories open up to something that allows you to hold them in your heart without guilt without shame without trying to beat yourself up as to what could I have done better. We can't turn back the clocks. And too often we forget that in our grieving process. We simply cannot turn back the clock. So let the memory be the blessing. Let the memory be the comfort. Let the memory say to you, you've done everything that you can. And comfort and the relief for them. Yes. Like Sassy saying, I forgot how good it is to run. That was the one thing that could help me. And I actually, Tawny was the one who had to talk me back onto the ledge because bef right before I was like, I can't do this. I am not sure. I cannot do this. I am not strong enough to do this. Completely falling apart at the seams. I can't do this. I cannot do this. There's no way I can do this. And she had to remind me this is, but it's not for you. It's for him. Yes. And so that relief, this is relief for him. This is relief for him. He's not going to have to suffer. He's not going to have to try to be frustrated that he can't communicate to me what he needs and why I can't give it to him and me be frustrated that I, that I'm not somehow meeting it. What, what is it? I didn't, I got it wrong. What do I do now? You know, that, that relief there. I can, I can tell you though, that, um, it, it is hard and I, I'm glad that I, could be there for you like I like for others but um I can only speak to that because we came way too close with Casey and no one knew that it was um going to be that close we had been told oh DM is slow progressing you know all of that for three years she rode her wheels <laughs> um a month shy of three years but yeah that's I mean so she had the she had been I mean, for a year before she got wheels, um, you know, so four years of this. And um, then suddenly within 24 hours, it all went down. And it was just so scary and terrifying to me that um, I made her a promise that we would do this as long as she wanted to. Um, I think, you know, people then can get into the discussion of, well, you should just euthanize them right when you find out. No, they're not ready yet. I mean, that's my own, it's a personal opinion, but they're still happy. They're still living life. They're still like, they just need wheels and they're good to go for another three years, like Casey's case, you know? 
But um, I think I had to experience that. Um, thankfully, she didn't suffocate to get to death, but it came so close. And um, like when we hit, when I promised her we'd only do it as long as she wanted to. And by um, Friday, I know Thursday was her best day ever in a long time. And uh, Friday, I noticed her breathing was changing, took her into the vet. He said, I see what you're saying today. It's not the day, but it's coming. And um, it, it, no one knew that it could change that fast. And by Saturday morning, she was saying, I'm done. And I didn't want to push her to the point where she had to tell me she was done like that. It, it wasn't It wasn't stressful on her. She was okay. It was terrifying to me absolutely terrifying and I, I share her story only because I don't want other people to have to experience that and so yes uh, Candy when when that you were saying I don't know if I can do this and I I just had I I don't want to encourage or discourage it, your choice your own choice and I think Miriam and I had a discussion too and it was closer to Sassy's time and um but it it was it's more like this is a disease that is taking them from you. This is not you making that call. If anything, you are preventing them. Thankfully, we have that that option and that right these days uh, for pets, and unfortunately, not for people yet or in all states. But um, gosh, to to be able to make that call when they're happy and he can eat the hamburger and he can have the chocolate shake and he can enjoy all this stuff and it's not like you're not running the risk of, you know when it gets that close i mean i was terrified for one i didn't want her to suffocate to death i told her i would help her before that it happened and we came close the for two we had a horse that did this their circulatory system shuts down first so when you go to administer the euthanasia drugs it doesn't circulate and it is terrible awful if it's not circulating it's a slow just awful death and so those two reasons do it for me every single time like i i just i share with you guys like yes i mean we, we never try to do anything prematurely you know like is their bark changing yes their bark is changing okay well casey kept going even when once she the disease had completely compromised her di diaphragm she had no voice left she would bark and nothing would come out you know and so like it was too far but she was happy she was eating she was bossy she was still telling me everything yeah. she just i mean how do you know you know and and so when hers changed so quickly she didn't suffocate to death only because I held her up upright on my, in my lap the whole way to the, yeah, to the vet. And, um, so my goal now is just to like share those that with you guys, when you're having to make that call and make that decision, like this is a blessing. Uh, yes, you live with guilt, but it, it's nothing compared to the guilt that you could live with if it had, like we didn't get there fast enough, you know, like I, I remember like, just hurry, please just hurry, please. I just really, you know, we'll talk afterwards. You knew I was coming, please just hurry. Let's just please, you know, and, 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 uh, the way you guys did it is so much better making their arrangements. They're happy. They're getting spoiled rotten. I mean, I think hammer had like the full on best freedom week ever. <laughs> He did. He did. It was perfect. And <laughs> it, the only thing we couldn't do, you couldn't get rid of the disease. We don't have a shot for that yet. Nope. Yet. And that's yeah. why we do what we do for Shade Out DM is fight, 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 fight. Spread the word. It doesn't have to be like this. We could make other choices and not breed these things. But bottom line, they don't all understand that until they've lived it. <laughs> and living it is... Is something that it, you know, I'm not okay. I'm not better. And this, you know, I, Casey crossed the bridge in 2017. Oh. Um, but my solution is to do something with that and fight, you know, and and sign up for things and educate people. And when Kat, you said that, you know, about the vets, 
yeah i mean and and not to discredit vets at all i'm so grateful for vets for me it it is just dumbfounded with how many you know now that we help people and do this how many people come to us from across the world but especially the united states and canada 